This is Restraint by Stephen Gallagher. Did you get a look at the driver who forced you off the road? The woman in uniform had pulled up a chair to put herself right alongside Holly's hospital trolley so she could speak close and keep her voice low. Holly made the slightest movement of her head, not even a shake, and was instantly sorry. The policewoman spoke again. Your son thinks it was your husband's car. Could that be right? We've called your house and there's nobody there. Holly meant to speak, but it came out in an unrecognizable whisper. Where are the children? Out in the waiting room. They've been checked over and neither of them's hurt. Your neighbor said you left some after some kind of an argument. I'd like some water. I'll have to ask if that's all right. Holly closed her eyes and a moment later heard the sound of metal rings sliding as the policewoman stepped out of the cubicle. Only a curtain separated her from the Saturday night crowd out in casualty. Pretty lively crowd, they sounded. She lay with a thin blanket covering her that brought her back here after the x-rays. It was a relief to hear that the children were unhurt, even though it was what she'd half expected. The short trip down the embankment would have shaken them up. It was only their stupid mother who neglected to put on her own seatbelt after making sure of theirs. That car, it had come out of nowhere. But if there was one thing that Holly knew for certain, it was that Frank couldn't have been at the wheel. Why? because she and Lizzie had struggled to lift him into the trunk of their own car not 45 minutes before. Assuming he hadn't leaked too much and no one had lifted the, the lid for a look inside, he had to be lying there still. He certainly wouldn't be going anywhere on his own. The young policewoman was back. I'm sorry, she said. I had to stop an argument. I forgot to ask about your water. Where's the car? Holly croaked. Still in the ditch, the policewoman said. The accident unit can get it towed away for you. You'll have to sort out the rest with your insurers. This was seductive. The linen smelled clean and felt fresh. Holly was all but exhausted. She'd been lifted, laid down, tended to. It'd be so easy to drift. The racket right outside was almost like a lullaby. But her husband's dead body was in the hood was in the trunk of her car. And the police were all over it, even as she lay there. Can I get that drink now? she said. As soon as the policewoman was gone, Holly tried to rise up on her elbows. The effort it called for surprised her at first. She made it on the second attempt. She was in her underwear, her outer clothing piled on a chair that stood against the wall. She started to climb off the trolley and it hurt, but it wasn't too bad. Nothing grated and nothing refused to take her weight. Her head ached and she felt a great overall weariness. There's no one part of her that screamed of special damage. The floor was cold under her bare feet. She stood for a moment with her hand resting on the trolley, and then she straightened. At least she could stand. She tweaked open the side curtain and put her face through the gap. In the next cubicle sat a young man on a chair, holding a spectacularly blood-stained dressing to the side of his head. He was in formal dress, with a carnation in his buttonhole and his tie all awry. He looked like the type who owned one suit and wore it for all his weddings, funerals, and court appearances. I wouldn't call you a shit sucker, Holly said. He blinked at her, uncomprehending. The man you came in with just did, she said. He was up on his feet in an instant, and as he flung back the outer curtain, she got a glimpse of the scene beyond it. The rest of the wedding party was out there, arguing with the staff and with each other. The bride in her gown could be seen in their midst. They rose in a wave as the bloody guest was spotted hurtling toward them, and the curtain fell back as if on the world's most energetic Punch and Judy show. That ought to keep her policewoman occupied for a while. Holly could feel the adrenaline pumping now, flushing her of all weariness and pain, leaving her wired and edgy and ready to roll. She dressed as quickly as she could, then instead of emerging into the open, she started to make her way through one dividing curtain after another toward the end of the row. The next occupied cubicle, an elderly West Indian man lay huddled under a red blanket. In the last sat a scared-looking woman with a small boy. He looked up apprehensively as she peered out of nowhere. "'Sorry to disturb you,' Holly said." Where's the children's waiting room? It was around a corner and separated from the main area by a short passageway and a couple of vending machines. Under a mural of misshapen Disney characters stood a basket of wrecked toys, some cover, cover, co coverless picture books, some undersized chairs across which a sleeping form lay. She woke up Lizzie, dragged Jack, protesting out of the corner playhouse in which he'd made a den. He quieted suddenly when he looked at her face. She took them both by the hand and they followed a yellow line on the hospital floor toward the exit. As they approached the automatic doors, Holly saw herself in the glass. But then the door slid apart and they sailed into the night to look for a taxi. 
In the presence of the driver, they asked her no questions, and they gave her no trouble. Lizzie was 12. She was dark. She was pretty, good at her lessons, and no good at games. Jack was only six, beefy little fair-haired, tonka trunk of a boy. Truck of a boy. The roads were quiet, and the taxi got them to the place on the ring road in 20 minutes. It's a good half mile on from where she'd expected it to be. The police were gone, but the car was still there. Do you want me to wait? The cab driver said, but Holly said no and paid him off. She waited until the cab was out of sight before she descended to her vehicle. The children hung back on the grass verge by the deep by the deep earth gouges that marked the spot where the car had left the carriageway. Spray-painted lines on the grass and on the tarmac showed where the accident unit had taken measurements. Down in the ditch, they left a big police-aware sticker on the back window for her to of her Toyota. The Toyota was old and it wasn't in the best of shape, but it was a runner, usually. Right now, it was stuck nose-first in the bushes along with all the wind-blown litter at the bottom of the embankment. The keys had been taken. Holly groped around in the wheel arch where she kept a secret spare. She crouched there. She glared up at the children. They were watching her. Two shapes etched against the yellow sodium mist that hung over the road. Her fingertips found the little magnetic box right up at the top of the arch, deep in the crusted road dirt. Got them, she said. Come on. Lizzie was nervously eyeing the Toyota as she and Jack came scrambling down. What are we going to do, she said. It's stuck here. We can't go anywhere. We don't know that for certain yet, Holly said, tearing off the police notice and then moving around to open the doors. She didn't know what the procedure was, but they couldn't have looked inside the trunk. However quick the glance, Frank would have been hard to miss. Jack climbed into the back without an argument for once. Lizzie got into the passenger seat. Once she was behind the wheel, Holly checked herself in the rearview mirror. At least when she'd hit her head on the roof, her face had been spared. Her vision had been blurred in the ambulance, hence the need for an x-ray, that had mostly cleared up now. Still, she looked a sight. She ran her fingers through to straighten her hair, and then she rubbed at her reddened eyes. Of course, that only made them worse. Here goes, she said, and tried the engine. It started on the second try. It was sluggish, and it didn't sound at all right, but it caught just the same. There was no point in trying to reverse up the banking, but she tried it anyway. The wheels spun, and the car went nowhere. So instead, she put it into first gear, tried going forward, squeezing on through the bushes. For a moment, it looked as if this wasn't going to work either. With a jarring bump, they lurched forward into the leaves. Switches bent and cracked as the Toyota forced its way through. She glanced in the mirror and saw Jack watching, fascinated, his foliage scraped and slid along the window only inches from his face. God alone knew what it was doing to her paintwork. They came out onto what looked like a narrow limestone track, which was actually a soak away at the bottom of the ditch. Staying in low gear, she began to follow its irregular line. After about a hundred yards, she was able to transfer across to a dirt road, which led in turn to a lane. The lane took them under the ring road and then around and back onto it. Once they were on hard tarmac again, Holly permitted herself to breathe. Not too much. There was the rest of the night still to be managed. And then, perhaps even more of a challenge, the rest of their lives thereafter. She hadn't seen it happen. She hadn't even been in the house. She'd come home to find Frank lying awkwardly at the bottom of the stairs, Lizzie sitting with her head in her hands at the top of them. Might have passed for an accident, but for the letter opener stuck in Frank's neck. He wasn't supposed to be in the house. The restraining order was meant to take care of that. He wasn't even supposed to come within a hundred yards of his daughter, regardless of where she might be. So, technically speaking, by being in the trunk of the car, he was in breach of the order right now. Holly's first thought had been to pick up the phone and call the police. Her second had been that perhaps she could first wipe off the handle, put her own prints onto it, and take all the blame. Then a sudden rage had risen within her. She looked down on his twisted body and felt no horror, no awe, no anguish or dismay. Just cheated. Frank had contrived to poison their existence while he was around. Was there to be no end to it even after him gone? She'd made the decision right then. They would not enter the process. If they moved quickly enough, they could put him right out of their lives and make a clean beginning. It would be a credible move. Frank could make an enemy in the time it took him to buy a newspaper, and his suspicion would be dispersed among the many. She looked at Lizzie and told her exactly what she had in mind. We can't, Lizzie had said. So Holly had sat her down and for ten solid minutes had laid out the choices for her, making sure that she understood how much depended on the next few hours. What was done was done, she'd said to her, 
There's no changing it now. Don't feel you're to blame. It's a matter of right or wrong. Your father made all the choices that caused this to happen. It had worked, kind of. I couldn't use Frank's car. Being in the motor trade, he'd used whatever vehicle was going spare on the lot. Of late, he'd been favoring a red car that was hardly practical for their job at hand. So Holly had backed her Toyota into the garage on the side of the house, lined the trunk with a plastic decorating sheet. Together, they dragged Frank through the connecting door and manhandled his body into it. Handling it was less, less of a problem than Holly had expected. In the unpleasant mistakes, Frank dead was hard-pressed to match up to Frank in life. Once he was safely stowed and covered in a couple of old towels, they drove driven out to collect Jack from school and then set off for the coast. Fish and chips on the pier, Jack. It's a surprise treat. You just have to make a call somewhere first, somewhere quiet. You'll stay in the car. Then the accident, the plan forced off course, but back on it now. From the ring road, they got onto the interstate. Traffic was heavier here, slowed when the carriageway narrowed to a single lane. For a long time, there was no visible reason for it, and suddenly they came upon a surfacing crew laying down a new tarmac under bright work lights. A colossal rolling tar factory that belched and stank like a dragon as it excreted a lane-wide ribbon of hot road. Men with shovels and brushes worked furiously in its wake, supervisors in hard hats chatting by their vehicles. Look, Jack, Lizzie said, big trucks. Big, big trucks, Jack said with awe and turned in his seat to watch through the back window as they left the stage drama behind. You like the big trucks, don't you, Jack? Holly said as the lanes cleared and the Toyota picked up speed again, but Jack didn't answer. Holly couldn't put a finger on it. The Toyota didn't feel quite right after the accident. She could only hope that it wouldn't let them down, as the outside of the car wasn't messed up too much. A police stop was something that she didn't dare risk. Next time she checked on Jack, he was asleep. His mouth was open and his head was rocking with the rhythm of the car. He slept the way he did everything else, wholeheartedly, with 100% commitment. For a moment, Tolly experienced a sensation in her heart that was like a power surge. This was her family. Everything that mattered to her was here, in this car. And then she remembered that Frank was in the car with them, too. Good old Frank, consistent as ever, bringing a little touch of dread into every family outing. They left the motorway, took a back road, and drove through a couple of darkened villages. There was a place she had in mind. Out to the north and west was a great bay whose inland fields and marshes were almost unknown beyond the region. At low tide, saltings and sand flats extended the land almost to the horizon. Much of what was now solid ground had once been part of the sea. In places, the sea was claiming it back, pushing the coastline inland so that the fields, even some roads, were being lost forever. Hide something well enough in, this, in the part that was disappearing, and, well, she'd have to hope. It was the best she could come up with. Somewhere along here, there was a causeway road that had once led to a farm long abandoned. People had trekked out to it for a picnic spot when there was something to see, and the shell had become unsafe and it had all been pulled down. Now there was just rubble and the lines of a couple of walls, and that only visible at a low spring tide. They crawled along, following the causeway with the Toyota's dipped beams. It didn't so much end as deteriorate steadily for the last couple of hundred yards. The concrete sections of the road had become tilted and skewed as the ground beneath them had given up any pretense of permanence. That section had drifted in, place they'd separated, in places they'd separated completely. She had to stop the car and get out to locate the cesspit. When she turned back, Lizzie was out of the car and standing beside it. She was looking around and she said, Have I been here before? Once, Holly said, before Jack was born. I brought you out here to show it to you, because it was a place my mother and father used to bring me. But it's all changed. Lizzie tried to speak, but then she just nodded. Then her control went altogether, and her body was suddenly convulsed with an air-sucking sob that was shocking both in its violence and in its unexpectedness. Holly moved to her quickly and put her arms around her, holding her tightly until the worst of it passed. There in the darkness, out on the causeway, with the moon rising and this thing of such enormity to be dealt with, it would be, an easy, it would be no easy night, no easy ride from here. Holly was only just beginning to appreciate how hard her daughter's journey would be. I can't do this, Lizzie whispered. Yes, we can, Holly told her. He got him out of the car into the pool and he floated just under the surface, hand drifting up into the pale shaft of dirt water light from the Toyota's beams. The first stone sank him, 
and they added others, as many as they could lift. Sudden gout of bubbles gave them a fright. Holly was convinced that it caused her heart to stop beating for a moment. They stood watching for a while to be sure of their work. Holly sneaked a glance at Lizzie. Her face was in shadow and impossible to read. We should say a prayer, Lizzie said. Say one in the car, Holly said. We need to get back and clean up the stairs. Back on the motorway, she watched for police cars, but she saw none. She did become aware of some lights that seemed to pace her for a while. When she slowed a little, the vehicle drew closer. She was able to see that it lacked the telltale profile of roof bar and blue lights. They had unmarked ones, of course. There was always that risk. After a while, the headlamps in her mirror began to irritate her. She slowed even more to let the car pass, but it didn't. So then she picked up speed and tried to leave it behind. Two minutes later, and as many miles on, it was still there. It surely meant nothing, and that was making her nervous. Lizzie seemed to pick up on this. She saw Holly's frequent glances in the mirror and turned herself around in her seat, straining at her belt to look out the back window. It's the same car, she said. What do you mean? The one that pushed us off the road. It can't be, Holly said. Lizzie clearly wasn't certain enough to argue the point. Well, it's similar, she said. Holly increased her speed even further, up and over the limit. The wheel began to vibrate in her hands as if the Toyota was beginning to shake itself apart. It couldn't be the same car. She couldn't imagine who'd want to follow her, or why. It seemed to be working. They were leaving the other car behind. Then she saw something out of the corner of her eye. She looked down. The oil light was on, the brightest thing on the dash. The one thing she knew about a car's oil light was that on a screaming engine it signaled an imminent disaster. She slowed, but it didn't go out. Other warning lights started to flicker on around it. So Holly quickly put the car out of gear and indicated to move off the motorway and onto the hard shoulder. They coasted to a stop. The engine was already silent by the time they reached a stop. It died somewhere during the deceleration. She couldn't be sure when. As they sat there, the cooling engine block ticked and clanked like coins dropping into a bucket. In the back, Jack was stirring. Fish and chips on the pier, he said suddenly. I'm sorry, Jack, Holly said. It's got too late. Another time. The other car was pulling in behind them, hazard lights flashing. Right then, a big bus passed them at speed in the inside lane. It slipped stream, rocked the Toyota on its wheels. Who is it then, Lizzie said, peering back as the other car came to a halt, about 50 or 60 yards back. I don't know, Holly said. Nobody. Jack said, is it Daddy? Holly looked at Lizzie, and Lizzie looked at her. There was a risk that Jack might have picked up on something then. All his attention was on the road behind them. The following driver was getting out. Just as the car was an anonymous shape behind the glare of its own headlights, the driver's figure was a slip of shadow against the liquid stream of passing traffic. No, Jack, Holly said, an inexplicable anxiety rising up within her. It can't be your daddy. She glanced down at the dash. All the warning lights were on now. That meant nothing. Everything always came on when the engine stalled. It is, Jack said. Holly could tell him it wasn't, but she couldn't tell him why. She heard Lizzie draw in a deep and shuddering breath and let it out again. She found her daughter's hand in the dark and squeezed it once. Traffic flew by, and the driver kept on coming. He was silhouetted against the flashing hazard lights of his own vehicle, pushing like an amber heart. Maybe he was your regular good Samaritan coming to offer them a hand. Or maybe he was one of any number of things, as yet unrecognized and uncatalogued. He's been in the rain, said Jack. Forget the oil pressure. Forget the ruinous cost of a thrown piston or a seized-up engine. So it was far more important to get herself and the children away from the spot. All the Toyota's power seemed to have gone. Engine turned over like an exhausted fighter trying to rise after a long count. She tried turning off the lights, and as the beams died, the sound of a starter immediately improved. It barked. It caught. All the warning lights on the dash went out, including the oil. She crashed the gears, checked her mirror once, and pulled out. Right now, her only concern was to get moving again. Jack was turned around in his seat, straining to see. "'Who is it if it isn't Daddy?' he said. It's nobody, Holly said. Face forward. He's running after us. Jack, she said. How many times have I got to tell you? She was expecting him to give her an argument. Something in her tone seemed to make him decide, and he, compl and he complied without another word. Nothing that she was supposed to hear, anyway. It was Daddy, she heard him mutter. She, she knew it wasn't. 
The thought was planted now and it spooked her. The sooner this was over with, the better. She wondered how they'd recall this night. Would it be etched in their minds so they'd relive it moment by moment? Would it move to the distance as a remembered nightmare? Jack must never know the truth. For him, this story would have to be that his daddy had gone away. He'd keep on looking forward to his father's return. But in time, he'd grow and the hope would fade and become part of the background noise of his life. For Lizzie, it was going to be a lot trickier. At least she was safe from her father now. Whatever problems she might have in dealing with the deed and its memory, that was the thing to keep in mind. Over a wooded hill, down into a valley, heading for home. Out there in the darkness were the lights of all those small towns that didn't rate exits of their own, were linked by the road that the motorway had replaced. That following car was back in her mirror. Perhaps it was some different car. It was impossible to say. All she could see were those anonymous lights. This time they were staying well back. Here came the roadworks again, same stretch, opposite direction. Again, one lane was coned off and the carriageway lights were out. A few moments after they had crossed into the darker territory, the driver behind her switched on his beams. They were the pop-up kind. She saw them swivel into view like laser eyes, just like on Frank's car. Jack said, can we have the radio? Not right now. It was working before. I'm trying to concentrate. He was closing the distance between them. Holly knew she couldn't go any faster. She looked down and saw their ignition lights were flickering and that once again her oral warning light was full on. They passed what remained of a demolished bridge with new concrete piers ready to take its wider replacement. Beyond the bridge site, just off the road, stood a mass of caravans and portable buildings. It was a construction village, a shanty town of churned up mud and giant machines. A temporary slip road had been bulldozed into the embankment to give access to works traffic. Holly waited until it was almost too late, and she, she swerved across the lanes and into the slip road. Something thumped against the car. In the mirror, she saw one of the cones go tumbling in her wake. The car behind her was swerving to avoid it. Made him overshoot the turnoff so he couldn't follow her. Now he'd be stuck. The traffic wouldn't allow him to stop and back up again. He'd be heading in the same direction for miles and miles. Good Samaritan, good riddance. All the lights in this temporary settlement were on, yet nothing moved. Jack was craning, eagerly looking around the various site office buildings as they entered the main area. But Holly got in first. Yes, Jack, she said. They have big trucks here. It was almost as bright as day, completely deserted. The yard was floodlit and every porta bin office had its lights on. Holly could see through all the uncurtained windows that every one of the offices was empty. She slowed and stopped and looked around. A few vans, a couple of big diggers, some concrete bridge sections waiting to be trucked out and assembled elsewhere. The site had the look of a frontier fort, obviously not intended to be here forever. It was hard to believe that the scars it would leave on the land could ever easily heal. They would, of course. The big machines would simply put it all back when they'd finished. It wouldn't be quite be nature, but everybody would be going by too fast to notice. She got out. There was the sound of a generator banging away somewhere in the background. Hello, she called out and then glanced back at the car. Jack and Lizzie were watching her through the side windows. Pale children, out on the road past their bedtimes, they looked hollow-eyed and tired. Jack, with his little round face, as he liked the stick version of the teenager she'd soon be. Holly gave him a brief smile and then moved out to look for someone. She didn't want to get too far from the car. She didn't want to let them out of her sight. She called again. This time someone came out from behind one of the buildings. He stood there. She had to walk over to him. He looked like a toothless old shepherd in a flat cloth cap, knuckly hands hanging down by his sides. He could have been any age, from a well-preserved 70, down to a battle he'd done by 50. Too old to be one of the road gang. He looked as if he'd been on road gangs all his life. She said, is anyone in charge around here? Never love, the man said. They all do what they saw them well like. Well, what do you do? I'm just the brew man. Holly looked around her at some of the heavy plants that stood under the lights, looking as if it had all been airdropped in to remodel the face of Mars. She said, I've been having trouble with my car. Is there anyone who can have a look at it for me? I've got some money. Andy's the mechanic, he said. Is he here? He's never here. Is it worth me waiting for him? Can I do that? You can do whatever you want. And added as if it was his all-purpose charm to ward off evil. I'm just the brew man. And then he trudged off. She went back to the car. I'm fed up with this, Jack said. I can't help it, Jack, Holly said. Try to understand. No, he said. 
barking it out like a little dog with all the passion and venom he could manage. Rather than argue or get angry, Holly got out of the car again to watch for Andy and the mechanic. The site wasn't quite as des deserted as it looked. It took a while to become attuned to it and to pick up the signals. The sound of a door, the sound of a door opening and closing somewhere. A glimpse of a figure passing from one building to another. She paced a little. She looked toward the motorway. For something to do, she raised the toy Otis hood and took a look at the engine in the vague hope that her car problems might have some blindingly obvious solution. But it looked like engines always did to her, grimy and complex and meaningless. There was a smell as if something had been burning. When she held her hand out over the block, she could feel the heat rising from it. She poked at a couple of the leads to no effect other than to get her hands dirtier than they already were. A voice called out, Are you looking for someone? The man was walking across the open ground toward her. He was short, dark, powerfully built. At least six upper teeth missing on one side, but from the way he grinned, the loss didn't seem to trouble him. Would you be Andy, she said. I might. I'm looking for you. She quickly explained her problem in case he started to get the wrong idea, and he moved her out of the way so he could take a look. It didn't take him long. Look at your fan belt, he said. If your drawers were that slack, they'd be down around your ankles. When that starts to slip, your battery runs down, you run out of power. Is it hard to fix? If I said yes, she'd be more impressed, he said. It was then that he noticed the two children inside the car. They were staring out at him. Yours, he said. Yes, Holly said. We've been to the seaside. He looked at her, and then he looked at the car. And then he said, You take the kids and wait in the brew hut while I have a go at this. Tell Diesel to make you a cup of tea. Is Diesel the brew man's name? It's what his tea tastes like as well. The brew hut was the oldest looking and most battered of the site buildings. It was up on blocks and reached by three stairs. The floor sagged as they stepped inside. There were about a dozen folding card tables with chairs around them. A sense of permanent grime everywhere. It was as if engine oil had been ground into the floor, rubbed into the walls, coated onto the windows. The brew man was sitting by a plug-in radiator reading a copy of The Sun. It wasn't a cold night, but the radiator was turned up high. The air inside the hut was stifling. He looked up as they entered. Holly said, Andy told us to wait in here. Is that all right with you? Whatever you like, the brewman said. I'm Maddie. He said you were called Diesel. Maddie's face fell. He looked out the window. Bastard, he said. He got up and stomped off. Given his mood and the likely state of his crockery, Holly decided not to press him about the tea. She ushered the children onto grimy plastic seats that stood against the wall. On the wall itself was tacked a selection of yellowing newspaper cuttings, all of them showing the debris of spectacular motorway crashes. Jack said, It stinks in here. Shh, Holly said. It does. She couldn't tell him it didn't because it did. She couldn't agree that it did in case Maddie was listening, so she only said, It won't be for long. They waited. There was a clock on the wall, but it was wrong. Jack swung his feet. Lizzie stared at the floor. Outside, a massive engine began to rev up somewhere close behind the building, making their chairs vibrate. Jack said, I'm bored. Play I Spy, Holly suggested. I'm not playing with him, Lizzie said. He can't spell. Holly said with an unexpected tightness in her tone, why don't we all just sit here quietly? There was silence for a while, and then Lizzie muttered rebelliously, it's true, he can't. And Jack agreed with her. I got a giant brain, he said. I can't spell. Holly covered her eyes. She wasn't sure whether she was laughing or crying, and the two children, equally uncertain, were watching her closely for clues. This night would pass. Somehow I'll be fine. Keep thinking that, she told herself, and it might even come true. Mom, Lizzie said. Holly looked at her and saw the unease and the apprehension in her eyes. She might be sharp, but she was still only 12 years old. And this part's over, she said. What then? She was choosing her words carefully because of Jack. Holly knew what Lizzie was trying to say. We'll carry on as normal, she said. Can we do that? We'll have to, Holly said. There was a tap on the window. Andy was standing there outside, raising himself up on tiptoe so that he could look in, and he beckoned to her. She went out, and they walked over to the car together. He told her he left the keys inside it. Best I can do, he said. I've tightened your fan belt and cleaned off your plugs. They're blacker than Maddie's fingernails. Thanks, Andy. Got a lot of oil down there. I don't know where it's coming from. You might need a new gasket. He showed her what he'd done and got her to feel the difference in the fan belt, which she pretended to appreciate. She offered him 20 quid and he took it with no embarrassment. 
and she went back for the children. The brew hut door was open. Lizzie was alone inside. Holly said, where's Jack? Lizzie had slumped down into her coat as if it was a nest, hands in her pockets and legs outstretched, looking at the toes of her shoes as she clacked them together. She said, he followed you outside. I didn't see him. He wanted to look at the big trucks. Holly went out. Jack hadn't gone over toward the car, or she'd have seen him. She stood in front of the brew hut and called out his name. Nothing. This was in the doorway behind her now. It's not my fault, she said defensively. Holly ran around by the side of the brew hut and found herself in an area lit by the most powerful of the overhead floodlights. Under the lights stood a few parked cars and a variety of dormant machines. She could hear the massive engine whose note had been shaking the brew hut's foundation could tell it was somewhere close. She looked back and saw that Lizzie had followed her some of the way. You look around the buildings, Holly said. I'll look here. She didn't wait to see how Lizzie responded, but started to make her way through the machine yard. Like a giant's bazaar of heavy engineering, the night sun casting deep, dark shadows under the gear. There were machines for ripping up the land, and they had spikes and claws and teeth on a saurian scale. Encrusted with clay and battered by hard use, they stood like bombed-out tanks. She hauled herself up and looked in the cab of a well-rusted bulldozer, bulldozer on tracks. Jack wasn't in it. By hanging on, she could look out over the yard. Down the next row, a wagon was being inched up onto a flatbed trailer by some driver she couldn't see. The tires on the wagon were enormous, and the ramps were bending under its weight. She looked all around and called Jack's name. She had little chance of being heard. The big engine roared, and the great tonnage slowly rolled. In her mind's eye, she saw Jack crushed or falling or struggling to get free of some unexpected snare. She saw gears turning, teeth meshing, pulling him in. She called his name again, louder, and hopped down to continue the search. She stumbled a little when she landed. The ground here was nothing more than churned up dirt into which stones had been dumped to give it some firmness. There was no playground. Jack, she called, moving forward. She came around by the bulldozer onto a firmer stretch of concrete road. She saw him. She could see all the way to the perimeter fence where he was climbing. Climbing? What was he doing? And then she understood and started to run. It was a storm fence, about eight feet high. Jack was already over the top of it and climbing down the other side. The fence rocked back and forth under his weight as the concrete posts shifted in their holes. He clung to it like a bug. Its close weave offered ideal purchase for his small feet and fingers. Holly stumbled on the rough ground but caught herself and went on. On the other side of the perimeter fence was an unlit country lane. Out on the country lane stood the red car with the pop-up headlights. Hey, she shouted. Hey, Jack, no! He was descending with his face set in a look of utter concentration. Behind him, the car was making a low purring sound, with its engine off but its electric fan sucking in the cool night air. The driver hadn't stepped out. She could barely see anything of him. She only guessed that he was watching her. Holly reached the fence, looking through it and up, up at him. Jack, she said, come down, Jack, please. You can't go over there. That's not your daddy. Believe me, there's no way it could be. But Jack didn't look at her didn't even show any sign of having heard. He was moving like a monkey. He reached down with his foot, found another space in the diamond pattern, hooked his scruff trainer into it before lowering the rest of his weight. She could touch his fingers as they hooked through, right in front of her eyes. Her breath through the wire could fall onto his face. Jack, she said, no! But he wouldn't look at her. Though he was only inches away, she couldn't reach him. She was powerless. Jack, she said, look at me, please. Don't do this. Don't go to him. She made a move as if to try and catch his hands through the wire, but it was pointless. She couldn't hold him if she caught him. All she could do was risk hurting him. Lizzie's looking for you as well, she pleaded. Oh, Jack. He jumped and hit the dirt on the far side with a thump. Holly made a leap at the wire and felt the entire fence lean before her, but she didn't have the agility and couldn't begin to climb the way he had. He was running for the car now. The car's passenger door was opening to receive him. Holly was screaming, though she didn't immediately realize it. The car door slammed and its laser eyes opened. The engine started and its nose swung around as it began to turn in the narrow lane. Her hands were up at the sides of her head. She'd heard of people tearing at their hair, but she'd always thought it was just an expression. She looked around wildly. Then she started to run along the inside of the fence ahead of the turning car. The country lane ran close on the other side. If there was a gap anywhere, she'd get through it. The car wouldn't pass her. No way was she going to let that happen. Here was a gate was a back way into the site little used. Big double gate, wide enough for a lorry, but chained and padlocked in the middle. 
There's enough play in the chain to make a gap of a foot or so. It was a squeeze, but not an impossible one. She came out on the other side. All she could see were the twin lights, the laser eyes of the beast that she had to impede. She put on a burst and dived into its way, sliding to a halt in the middle of the lane and raising both her hands. When it hit her, she felt nothing other than her own sudden acceleration. No impact, no pain, just the instantaneous switch from rest into motion as her legs were knocked from under her. She was spun down the side of the car. Afterwards, she'd never known whether she really saw it or only imagined the memory. But Holly went down hard in the wake of the moving car with a mental picture of her son's blank face only inches away on the other side of the glass. She lay there. She couldn't move. She could hear that the car had stopped and she wanted to lift her head to look, but nothing happened. Oh God, she was thinking. I'm paralyzed. Then when she made an enormous effort, her hand came up and braced itself against the ground. As she was doing it, she heard a car door opening. She wasn't paralyzed, but she had no strength. She tried to push down with her hand to raise herself. Her arms trembled and nothing happened. Someone was walking up behind her. Before she could muster the energy to turn and look, strong fingers gripped the back of her head and thrust her face down into the mud. In an instant, she was blinded and choked. She found her strength now all right. Did her no good as a sudden knee in her back pinned her further to the ground. She struggled and flapped like a fish and her face stayed under. The blood roared in her ears and light exploded before her eyes. And in an instant, the pressure was off. First deep breath nearly drowned her on the spot. She sucked in all the mud that had filled up her mouth. She retched and coughed, blowing it out of her nostrils and heaving up what she'd both swallowed and inhaled. She felt a lighter touch on her shoulder and lashed out, only to hear a cry from Lizzie. She was there when Holly's vision cleared, keeping back and holding her arm where she'd been struck. I'm sorry, Mom, she said. Holly stared dumbly for a moment before an understanding started to form. Lizzie was backing toward the waiting car. No, Lizzie, she said. She tried to rise, but one of her legs wouldn't support her. I know how you want me to feel about it, but I can't. I wish I could. I'm sorry. It's never going to be right after tonight, whatever we do, ever. Holly made another massive effort, and this time made it up and onto her feet, putting all her weight onto the uninjured leg. Wait, she managed. Lizzie had reached the car. I'm the one that he wants, she said. He'll take Jack if I don't go with him. The passenger door popped open about an inch. I'm sorry, she said again. She reached out and opened it all the way. Holly wasn't close enough to see how it worked, but Jack popped out of the vehicle as if propelled on a spring. He landed on both feet as he quickly slipped around behind him and into the car. The door closed like the door on a well-fitting safe, and the car's engine started to rev. It was all as swift, as swift and decisive as that. Holly started toward them, half hopping, half limping. The car was already moving off and started to pick up speed. Frank, she shouted, you bastard, give her back. The sound of her voice, Jack seemed to wake as if from a daze. He looked about as if suddenly remembering something. He spotted those red tail lights receding off into the darkness. He gave a strangled cry. Dad, he called out and started to run down the lane after the car, slapping down his feet so hard that the ground almost shook. Holly hadn't yet reached him, and her cries couldn't stop him. Neither of them had any chance of catching the car. Both of them tried. She caught up with him a full ten minutes later, still standing on the dark spot where his breath and his hopes had finally given out. He forgot me, he wailed. Holly dropped to her knees and pulled him to her. For once, he let her hold him.